economy when poll after poll shows people are struggling. 60% of the country is living paycheck to paycheck. They're dealing with a 60% spike in gas prices. Uh, consumer prices are up 17% under the, this presidency. Yet you just heard Jared Bernstein tout that the buying power of your paycheck is going up. So that is an outright lie. And I think the fact of the matter is prices are up 16%. Forget the rate of inflation, which has gone up and down. It may gone up, go up or down. The cumulative inflation is over 16% prices having gone up under the current administration, while wages have been flatlined by comparison. So everyday Americans understand when they go to fill up gas at the pump, buy groceries at the grocery store, there's a reason why they're feeling that pinch. And I think the sheer level of dishonesty, the gall of the Biden administration, to be able to lie with these numbers. The other area where they're lying with, by the way, Sandra, is the job numbers. You want to think about the greatest sector that has shown job growth. It is actually in the sector of none other than the government. So when increases in, in employment or improvement in employment is not driven by increased productivity in the private sector, but is instead driven by the government itself being the main source of expanded employment, we have a structural problem in our economy. And the reason Americans aren't buying it is not just because they can read the facts more effectively, though many of them can, mm -hmm. but also because of their own experience. And a big part of the problem, I just got out of a speech laying this out, was the cancerous administrative state, those three-letter agencies that are issuing encumbering regulations on businesses small and large that are our chief impediment to economic growth in this country. And unlocking GDP growth, I think, has to be a top priority of the next U.S. president. It certainly is for me. So job, jobs are a big issue uh, for you today. And we were talking yes. about this, uh, you and I on the set, while we were watching Jared Bernstein. You gave a speech this morning in which you outlined a plan to cut a million jobs from the federal workforce Yes. Uh, over a course of four or five years. Yes. And the question is how you would do that. You, you, you're thinking of actually targeting the Department of Education, the FBI, the ATF, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Commerce Department among them. Uh, how do you cut those jobs? What legal basis do you have to do it? Sure. What do you do with all those federal workers who suddenly won't be drawing a paycheck? So a couple of things. On the latter question, we actually have more open jobs right now than we have people in this country, John. So you could actually kill two birds with one stone, as D.C. bureaucrats can find honest work in the private sector and help stimulate the economy that way. Frankly, the job of the federal government is not to provide employment to the bureaucrats. So here's what I've said is a lot of the advisors in the D.C. bureaucracy, they have duped good presidents from Reagan to Trump by telling them you can't fire these employees because of so-called civil service protections. What I laid out in my speech down the road earlier today is that actually the laws of this country do give the U.S. president power to act, not with individual firings, mm. but with mass layoffs. And mass layoffs are not covered by those civil service protections. That, That's what I'm bringing. Hold that thought for a minute. Today, uh, all right, we're going to jump out of this. John Kirby there answering questions from our Jackie Heinrich. Uh, the two big headlines coming out of this. Uh, Kirby insisting that the $6 billion that they freed up is not a ransom payment and that there will be strict controls exercised over that money that sits in a cuttery bank by the U.S. Treasury Department. We'll see if that works or not. 2024 Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy still with us. We're comfortable in the parameters of this deal, said John Kirby. Similar to the defense of this deal that we heard from the State Department yesterday, Kirby clarified that Iran has to make requests, he said, uh, for these withdrawals for humanitarian purposes only. He said it is not a blank check. Do you see it otherwise? Of course. I mean, we have to actually speak honestly and call a spade a spade. It's almost Orwellian, the exact opposite of what he said on both of those counts. One is money is absolutely fungible. So just because they can't use those exact dollars for the purpose they've laid out doesn't mean that they can't change their budgets on other parts of their humanitarian aid so that they're able to redirect that to areas where they can't use that money. Money is by definition fungible. And the other thing is this is absolutely a ransom payment. And this is a deeper point in the United States. When we are ourselves weak at home, when we have weak and indecisive leaders at home, our adversaries know to exploit that. 
there's a reason why these ransom payments are even higher, even compounded by the rate of inflation, than the last time that we've gone through the same exercise. It's because we have a weak U.S. president whose commitments are not credible, and our adversaries around the world know that now is the moment to exploit it, whether it's Iran or otherwise, communist China for that matter. That's exactly what you are seeing today, and it's a shame. So you heard Kirby say there, Vivek, that uh, the U.S. Treasury Department will e exert strict controls over this money, that the Iranians will have to request it. Ibrahim Raisi says, I don't care what you say, this is our money, we're going to use it the way we want. Listen to what he yeah. said. This money belongs to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and naturally, we will decide, the Islamic Republic of Iran will decide to, sp to spend it wherever uh, we need it. Kirby said, oh, he's wrong. It doesn't work that way. But when have we ever been able to really control what Iran does? Well, I think he's just saying the quiet part out loud. As much as I disagree with him, I think that and he's, a, he's a bad individual. I think that he's speaking the truth about what happened here. Money is fungible, and just because they cut it from one pocket doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to spend their budget. They're $6 billion richer. That's the bottom line for a country that supposedly is supposed to be getting sanctioned by the U.S. So I think that this is a shame. It's another example of hypocrisy in our failed foreign policy from the last 25 years. I do think that we require a new generation of leadership mm -hmm. in our foreign policy included to be able to be strong at home, to be able to stick to our commitments, to be able to hold to our red lines, be very clear about what we will and won't do. And that's how we're going to recommand respect on so, the global stage. That's what I'm going to re-deliver as the next U.S. president. Vivek, so these uh, five American citizens, they were detained in Iran. Um, this was obviously um, the, the, the reason for all of this. If you were in power and you wanted to bring these American citizens home, how would you have done it? How would you have constructed this deal? Well, first of all, I would say that my heart goes out to those families. I know I cannot even imagine what they have gone through. And I think it is good news in the middle of all the politics of this to still celebrate the return of Americans who deserve to be at home. But the answer is, I would have never put us in this position, because if you're going to apply a maximum pressure campaign to a country, then do it correctly, because that only works if there's no back door out. The problem is Iran has gotten closer in its relationships with China and with Russia. And so part of this is a failed diplomacy with Iran that predates this particular crisis. So it's not just this deal. It's the backdrop conditions for this deal as we see nations like Iran aligning more closely with our adversaries in communist China and also driving them further into the hands of Russia. I think it's shameful that even as we are supposedly arming Ukraine to go to war with Russia, we in the United States have to use Russia as an intermediary here. It shows how we're weak on multiple fronts. And I think that's the deeper problem. I have a more comprehensive vision of our foreign policy that says, hey, I'll keep us out of World War III, but in the meantime, we have to declare economic independence from our own adversaries. That's what's important. And assert actual American interests rather than putting ourselves in these positions of weakness in the first place. In, in terms of close relationships, the relationship between Russia and North Korea has become closer. Yes. Kim Jong un is there visiting with Vladimir Putin, implications for the Ukraine war because Putin is looking for new weapons. And I want to push you a little bit on your sure. Ukraine Russia policy because you've said that you would freeze the lines of control where they are. We've got a graphic that we can put up of yep. where those lines are. But you would use that as leverage to get Russia to break its strategic alliance with China. My question to you is, if you give Putin eastern Ukraine, regardless of what deal yeah. you cut with him, how do you know that he is not going to one day say, you know what, I got eastern Ukraine, I'm going to go back for the rest of it? Well, so look, there's a backstop to this, which is now U.S. actually interests backstop again. So if Putin reneges on that deal, we can put in hard requirements to say that that could be instant admission of Ukraine to NATO. There could be all kinds of consequences for Russia, a maximum pressure campaign economically. But the truth is, under the deal that I would do, Putin would have no reason to do it. Okay, the reason why... If, he had if, no reason to do it in the first well, place. Well, I, I actually respectfully, <laughs> I actually, I respectfully disagree from the position that he's actually in. He is economically having to rely more on China today precisely because we've put them in that position. So if we reopen economic relations with no, Russia... No, but I'm saying he has Putin, no reason to invade Ukraine. Well, so look, this is, this is a long and complicated history. Putin is craven. His actions have been craven. I've said as much. We can't trust Putin. To be the next but we can, we so can trust... you to a guy who wants to be the next czar, you can have Eastern Ukraine. I'm not saying you can have Eastern Why Ukraine. I'm not saying you can have Eastern Ukraine. I'm saying we would do a deal that requires Russia to exit its military partnership with China. 
That's what matters to the United States. The Russia-China alliance is the single greatest threat that we face. Take Russia's hypersonic missile capabilities, combine it with China's naval capacity, our economic dependence on China. That is the real threat we face in the United States. And I see an opportunity to use the Ukraine war as a way to achieve a more vital U.S. Yeah. objective by pulling Russia apart from China. Nobody in either party is talking about it, but that's how we ultimately stay out of World War III while also reducing our economic independence, our, our economic dependence on China. And that's how I'm going to leave. Vivek, just on that note, there's some headlines crossing right now um, based on what we're hearing at the White House and also a briefing that's happening at the State Department. Uh, the White House, through John Kirby, just saying we obviously have concerns about defense relationship between North Korea and Russia. At the State Department just a short time ago, uh, the State Department said it's troubling when you see Russians talking about cooperating with North Korea on programs that would violate U.N. Security Council resolutions. This also crossing, it's a concern that Russia could be actively promoting the improvement of North Korea's missile program. What do you take away from that? Or make I think it? these are deeply concerning, Sandra, and reinforce the same point. I worry we have a U.S. president that is sleepwalking us day by day closer to World War III. And I see an opportunity as the next president to do what Nixon did in 1972. Nixon did not trust Mao, but he pulled him out of the USSR's alliance. I think Putin is like the new Mao. Reopen economic relations with Russia, do a reasonable deal that allows Ukraine to still have its sovereignty intact, but use that to pull Russia out of China's hands, pull apart the alliance with North Korea. This is how we achieve security, not because we trust Putin, but because we can trust him to follow his self-interest. And that's how we de-escalate a growing alliance between Russia, China, and North Korea that I think is deeply problematic for U.S. interests. And it will take a new generation of leadership in our foreign policy to keep us out of the kinds of wars that we've sleepwalked our way into, both parties, frankly, over the last 25 years. Uh, so I know that you've got to go. One last question, yeah. because you talk about a new generation of leadership. Yeah. We just got breaking news in the last couple of minutes that uh, Senator Mitt Romney yeah. of Utah has said that he is not going to run for re-election, citing his age, which is 76 years old, as the main reason, saying he wants to clear the way for a new generation of leadership. In the meantime, we've, we've, there, we know the stories of Mitch McConnell, Dianne Feinstein, Joe Biden. I mean, even former President Trump is 77 years old. What, what, what do you say to what Romney is saying, saying, I'm leading by example here, I'm bowing out because my time is done? So I do respect Romney for making that decision. I think that's the right decision for him and for the future of the Republican Party and for our country. That being said, I don't favor age limits. It should be left to the voters and also people like Romney making decisions like the one that he's just made. One thing I will say, though, in this discussion, John, is it's not just about age. It's also about where we're going, not only a fresh generation of leaders, but a fresh generation of ideas for how we actually move this country forward. So there are people who are younger than Romney or McConnell or otherwise that still espouse reciting slogans memorized in 1980. And I don't think that's going to be the way we move the country forward. I think we have to wake up to the unique threats we face today from the administrative state at home, which is the real threat today, not Congress as well as abroad on the global stage, it's communist China, not the USSR. And so I think that takes a fresh perspective. Speaking for my part, I'm the youngest person ever to run for US president as a Republican. And I do think it takes somebody whose best days may still yet be ahead of himself in life to see a country whose best days are still yet ahead, too. Okay. Thank you for spending time with yeah. us today. Thank you for hanging through the briefings as well. Really thank appreciate you. it. Good seeing you guys. Vivek, thank, thank you so much. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most...